It has been one year since the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls submitted its final report to the Government of Canada. It called for an end to systemic racism toward Indigenous people through the decolonization of government institutions, legislation and policies. There was overall 231 calls for justice in the report, among them a special investigative task force to rebuild trust between Canada's police services and Indigenous peoples. So how much progress has been made? Marion Buller chaired the Inquiry. She joins us from Vancouver. Hi, Ms. Buller. Good to have you back on the program. Well, thank you. I'm glad to be back. On this uh, day where we're sort of demarcating one year since the release of that comprehensive report that you worked uh, on with so many others, uh, I noted the statement that you released with your colleagues around or calling for really an outside or international body to oversee the implementation of the recommendations that, that you all made through this report. Why do you think that's necessary? It's necessary to have international oversight for a couple of reasons. First of all, in the past year, uh, the government, the federal government has made it clear that they either are unwilling or unable to provide leadership in developing the National Action Plan. That's the first reason. The second reason is, uh, if you look back in history, the only way that there's been uh, movement, there's been change to the Indian Act, for example, is when Indigenous women have gone to the UN uh, Human Rights Commission and made complaints. So once the light was shone on Canada, things started to move. And the third reason is uh, there has to be some acknowledgement, not only in theory, but also in practice, that we're working on a nation to nation basis. So uh, if we can't work on a nation to nation basis, let's bring in international help. Would that be uh, through the UN? Like, is there a certain body that you have in mind? Well, there's several options. There's the United Nations, and, and we know that they have the High Commission on Human Rights with several advisors and representatives. There's the Organization of American States that has already been involved to a certain extent with the issues of MMIWG, Missing Murdered Indigenous Women, Girls and 2S People in Canada, and what has been happening or not happening. So there's been some movement there already. And don't forget, there's always the International Red Cross that deals with the issue of genocide. I remember speaking with you exactly a year ago on the day of the release of this report. And I, I think, and, I, and you please correct me if I'm wrong, I, I could characterize you as having some optimism that those recommendations would be implemented or there would at least be a specific plan uh, towards implementing them. How do you feel today? Well, I have mixed thoughts because I can tell you there's been great movement made at the grassroots level. Uh, the frontline service providers have really taken to heart the need for change. Uh, and we've seen some movement with funding of shelters and other safe places for women. But again, as I've said, the, the government, federal government seems to be either unwilling or unable to provide the necessary leadership to move ahead with a action, national action plan. And that requires, as we know, moving ahead with provinces, territories, and indigenous governments. I'm not saying it's an easy job, but it's something that has to be done and has to be done in a timely way. I want to put to you, because of course uh, my colleague uh, Olivia Stefanovic has been working on this story for a while and, and went to the government for their response. I want to put to you some of what they said. Uh, they of course point to the pandemic as delaying plans uh, for, for a national implementation plan. They say that they still are intent on doing one, but that the plan has been delayed. Uh, they also talk about funding, for example, to protect languages and cultures, uh, extra funding for child and family services, uh, community-based services to address mental wellness needs uh, in first Nations communities. Uh, they, they, they list a lot of that funding and increases to that funding. Uh, what would you say to, uh, to their response and in particular the, the, um, the reasoning around the pandemic? Well, <laughs> where to start? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, first of all, the government has said uh, because of COVID, uh, we're not able to provide a national action plan. But they haven't said by when they anticipate being able to present a national action plan. They've just left us, all Canadians, in a void of information here. Uh, we know that governments all across Canada at various levels have been able to mobilize and uh, 
provide tremendous resources and, and support in other ways uh, for people in the community, for all Canadians. So uh, I don't buy it, to be blunt. Uh, we have Zoom. Look at what we're doing right now. We have Zoom. We have FaceTime. We have email. We have telephone still. I, I just simply don't buy it. It's, it's not an excuse. Now, uh, the government has said, yes, we've given money. Well, our report is more about power sharing and partnerships. And I don't see that fundamental paradigm shift in relationships happening at all. If they are happening, they're very well hidden. Speaking of those paradigm shifts, I, I really did want to also um, get your perspective on the discussion that's happening right now due to, uh, of course, the events of the last week and a half south at the border. And in particular, the discussion around institutional or systemic racism in this country. When you hear that discussion taking place right now, what's going through your head? Well, I'm thinking it's about time that people started, first of all, admitting that systemic racism exists. And now we're starting to have some difficult conversations. But the first step is saying, yes, it does exist. We have to make that admission in order to move forward. And it does exist. Our national inquiry final report itemized in many ways systemic racism and the effects on violence. And and I guess what what is the, uh, I mean, there are so many takeaways, but but as far as, I mean, I just think part of the discussion is, of course, should or has to be the effects of systemic racism on Indigenous people in this country, obviously. And I, and I wonder um, if there is a way to, or, or if there is something for us to take away from the discussion we're having in this moment as we look towards the implementation of the plan that you and your colleagues put forward. You know, I think there's several takeaways for the discussions that we're having right now. First of all, uh, we have to say that the status quo is not good enough, obviously, because people are dying. Uh, indigenous women are dying, they're being murdered, they're going missing. 2S people are, are simply disappearing. So the status quo is not good enough. And what we have to do is understand the types uh, and causes of systemic racism and start decolonizing ourselves. Okay, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Ms. Buller. Pleasure as always to have you with us. Always my pleasure. Thank you so much and stay well. You too. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.